Hello, hello, Catholics Against Militarism. Welcome to part two of my conversation with Father McCarthy, Should a Christian Vote? Uh, part one was published, oh, about two years ago. Sorry it took me so long to get the second half up, but I found it today and I thought to myself, what a perfect day to publish it. A little late though to change anyone's mind about voting, but you can listen to part two and see if you didn't find part one convincing, you can listen to part two and see if you find it convincing and then file it away for next time when you decide to, uh, I don't know, go cross country skiing or something instead of going to the, the polls. Um, so yes, I think I said last time before part one that this would probably be one of those that would make a lot of people unsubscribe. But listen to it. It's pretty compelling. It's a great conversation. Um, before we get started with that, I wanted to use this opportunity to just tell you a little bit about something that I'm up to outside of the podcast. I don't know if I've mentioned it on the podcast before, but for the past 14 years, I've basically been working with homeschooling families. Um, and somehow I fell into uh, teaching homeschooling families. I started out as an online writing coach and um, did that for a couple of years. And then I worked at a hybrid school. I've worked with local co-ops before. And then for the past nine years, I've been uh, teaching at an online academy for Catholic homeschoolers. Well, even more specific, an online academy for Catholic homeschoolers with a focus on classical education. So um, I've absolutely loved it. But this past summer, I decided, I don't know, maybe it had something to do with the whole like COVID thing, you know, how they were trying to destroy all the small businesses. And maybe I just felt like I needed to stick it to, you know, George Soros and Bill Gates and all those guys or something. But I thought to myself, I'm going to start up my own business. So I will now be teaching uh, my own classes online. And if you look in the description, you can get a link to those. Um, they're not available for purchase yet, but if you can check them out, um, I will have more details forthcoming in the next couple months and an official website. But if you want to get a feel for what I'm doing, you can click on those and you can even subscribe to the newsletter and I will keep you posted when things become available. I'm looking to teach my first class, uh, release that first class in January on The Iliad by Homer, one of my favorite books. Probably my favorite book besides Pride and Prejudice. I know that's cheesy, but it's so good. But Homer's second best. Um, that's Achilles back there. He's my little mascot. He's, he's sulking. He's sulking. And then it will be followed by the Odyssey, of course. So if any of you are homeschooling parents, if you've listened to the podcast and you think that you might trust me with your um, teaching your children, um, I'm really eager to work with more homeschooling families. And I'm really looking forward to, um, as much as I loved teaching in a school, I'm really looking forward to teaching outside of a school um, because, you know, there's a there's a different pace, I think, that you can go at. You can go a little slower. You can spend a little more time on stuff. You can go a little deeper in the, into the reading. Um, some of my students at my old school in my creative writing class would sometimes uh, laugh at me because we would study The Red Wheelbarrow by William Carlos Williams. So much depends upon the red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. I think it's 15 words and we could spend like an hour and a half talking about that poem and at the end of class the bell would ring and we still hadn't gotten through the whole thing. So I really love to like go deep into these books um, and, and really, really get to the meat of them, right? And talk about all the themes and all the great things in the language and I think um, that kind of teaching and that kind of learning can be really beneficial, especially when it comes to things like critical thinking and and learning an appreciation for something like poetry. Um, so if you're interested, I hope you'll check it out. The name of the company that I'm working with right now is Teach to the Text. I wanted to print this in color, but um, I couldn't figure out how to do that. My printer wasn't working. I'm a better teacher than I am technologically proficient. Um, but yeah, that's Socrates. He has a book on his head. Why? I don't know. It just made me laugh. So anyway, <laughs> if you want to check it out, I'd love to uh, I'd love to teach some of the children of the people who listen to this podcast. And the great thing is you can take the classes from anywhere. Um, so if you're in Germany or overseas or in Canada, it doesn't matter. We can I can still um, teach your kids and I would love to do so. So thanks for listening. And I hope that there will be more details forthcoming about all that. Um, but enjoy this second part of the podcast and keep your chin up. 
whatever happens with this whole election thing, remember who's in charge. All right. God bless. See you next time. So it has often been said by many, people don't know what the state is until they have a grievance and come up against it. And then they find out. And so, yeah, all states are rooted in violence, period. And therefore, those that lead them have to use the violence. Put it, put it another way, I just want one final thing to be clear on this. Theologically, theologically now, in terms of the gospel, not in terms of Thomas Aquinas or other people, theologically, it is not absolute that a state cannot be constructed on the basis of the gospel. That is not an absolute. The gospel leaves open the possibility that a, a, a structure in a form can be instituted based on what Jesus taught. But be clear, the reason that doesn't happen is, and probably will never happen, will probably not happen for a long time, is because people, not people, not Jews, not Muslims, not atheists, Christians, do not believe Jesus knows what he's talking about when he, tell, when he speaks of love of enemies, do good to those who hate you, turn the other cheek, walk the extra mile, put up the sword, because they do not believe the person that they say is God, Jesus, and that they adore, because they do not believe indeed that this man knows what he's talking about and, and, and call him utopian, illusionist, unrealistic. That non-belief in Jesus guarantees that a state, a community, an institution based on the teaching of Jesus will never arise because it will never be tried. And the question is there, is unbelief in Jesus' way is his, his way in the gospel, is unbelief in that, unbelief in Jesus. We're not answering that question here. So yeah, um, his way being obviously powerful, but not that kind of power, not using that kind right. of power. Right, many, many forms of power. His power is the power of love, why? Because oteos agape est, God is love, agape. Unconditional, everlasting love. As it says, as it says in the, in the um, Catholic Roman Missal, the official Missal of the Catholic Church for, for, for um, masses, as it says for the mass and peace and justice, the opening line of the opening prayer is, God of perfect peace, in whom violence and cruelty have no part. Bingo, case closed. Governments are universally instruments of violence and cruelty to get order to get done what they want to get done. If God, and that's the God that Jesus is incarnate of, that's the God that Jesus teaches his way, his life, his truth. That's the God that is the way to eternal life. Love is a power. Love changes people. Let me give you an example, just a tiny little example. Suppose, Ellen, that, that 2,000 years ago, you and I on a nice Friday afternoon, you know, the day before the Sabbath, and we're walking by this, um, we're in Jerusalem, and, and we're walking by this, um, this rat hole of a hill, you know, kind of a little hill there. And there's dogs and lice and vermin and all kinds of things around. It, the, the hill's called Golgotha. It's outside Jerusalem. And this is where the Romans, uh, uh, this is where the Romans executed people by, by a crucifixion. That was their way of executing. Jews stoned people to death. The Romans executed them by, by crucifixion. And on that hill, for the 500 years, for, for the, uh, uh, for, for, for the uh, 10 years or 15 years before and after Jesus, there was, they probably executed 10,000 people there. The Romans, they, they, 
at, when Jesus was a kid up in uh, Galilee, they executed 10,000 Galileans by crucifixion. This is normal. This was the normal thing that Romans did. This is, this is how they lived. This is what they were imbued with as their value system. Okay. So we're walking by that little execution hill, you know? Uh, kind of like Huntsville Prison in Texas, you know? This is where they executed people. They do the same place all the time. And, um, and so, and so what we, we, we almost don't pay any attention because we've become so used to it now, as we have in the United States with executions and torture and all kinds of other terrible things, you know, just become inured to it. So we're walking by. Now remember at Jesus' time, the Roman emperor was Tiberius Caesar. And Tiberius Caesar was a magnificent emperor. I mean, first of all, he was adored as God. Secondly, any place he went, people, people were in awe of him. Thirdly, he was a highly competent emperor. He, 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 he did all kinds of wonderful things uh, to make life better in Rome for people like, uh, like um, indoor plumbing places to bathe all the time, highways, buildings, okay. He, he was everything. If, 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 if Tiberius Caesar appeared with his people on the street, everyone would be in utter awe of him. Power, he had power, okay. So now we're walking by the hill of Golgotha this day before the Sabbath. And we see this guy being crucified up there. He's bloody, he's torn to pieces by the whipping and the lashing, he's naked. Um, got a crown of thorns on him, bleeding all over the face. He stretched his arms stretched out, he's suffocating to death, hardly able to breathe. And somehow we hear him say, Father forgive them for they know not what they do. Would you and I turn to each other in, in absolute stunned awe and say, there's power. There is real power. Oh my goodness, I've never, I've never seen such power. Probably of course, not. <laughs> of course not, of course not. Yet, if Tiberius Caesar came along and there he was with his chariots and his soldiers and his golden armor and everything else. Oh, there's power. We'd be in awe of them. Power is the capacity to produce change. Power is the capacity to make things happen. Today, today, right this moment, the date is, the date is October 15th, 2002 AD, in the year of our Lord. Tiberius Caesar is a footnote. He is a footnote in history. And all time, all time is measured by, all time is measured by the man on the cross who said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Who lived, taught, and lived unto death. The love that is the reality of God, the power of God, that's power. And that's authority too. But Christians don't see that as power ever since Constantine the power that they they, 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 the, the, they they replaced the power of love with the power of the state, the power of politics. And they've actually built their churches, all of them, around governmental models. In fact, even to this very day, huh? even to this very day, the Vatican, the Pope, the Vatican state, the Catholic church is a state, an international state affirmed by the Geneva Convention. Just the other day, the day before yesterday, 
they sent out an international criminal warrant to arrest some woman who was involved in finances to bring it back to the Vatican State to be tried as a state. But states only work one way, power, not with authority, not with love. And therefore, what we have done basically in the Christian churches, what we have done basically in the Christian churches is we have gone, gone Orwellian. You know, Orwellian with his new speak and his, uh, you know, love is hate, war is peace. Yes. Yeah, we, we've gone that route and we've said, and we said, Jesus teaching to love your enemies, to love all people at all times under all circumstances, which he taught by word and deed unto death, is fulfilled by using violence and even death to make people conform into behavior that we want them to conform to. Charlie, are you saying that the dogma does not live loudly within you? What dogma? Do you know what I'm referencing? No, I, think, I don't know. Oh, it's something that's going on around lately where uh, Feinstein was interviewing Amy Cohen Barrett or whatever, and this was a few years ago, and she said, the dogma lives loudly within you. Um, and so a lot of Catholics are going around, you know, with t-shirts now that say the dogma li lives loudly within me. But when you're looking at that catechism quote, and you're saying that it's wrong, that we have a moral obligation to vote, and you're critiquing um, some of these positions of the church, I guess I was just trying to make a bad joke, saying that the dogma maybe doesn't live loudly within you. Um, All right. Good, but I good, guess... Good question. I'm Good question, Noellen. Good question to clarify for your listeners, because the first distinction is that Jesus' teaching is the kingdom of God is within you, not the dogma. And kingdom, by the way, is better translated from the Greek as the reign of God is in you. When the reign of God is in you, you have the capacity and the choice to love as Jesus loved because God is love where the love that is Jesus, the love that is God is in you and is activated, there is the reign of God in you and wherever you are in the universe. However, the distinction that has to be made is between dogma, doctrine, tolerated opinion. The catechism for the most part is not dogma. It is, it is doctrine. Which means dogma, if you say something is dogmatic, like the dogmatic constitution on revelation in the Vatican II documents, the dogmatic, anything that's dogmatic means it is infallible, either by the Pope saying so or by an ecumenical council declaring it such. Anything that a Pope has said infallibly I don't know, maybe the Immaculate Conception, the Assumption. I believe completely, completely. Anything that an ecumenical council has said infallibly, the Trinity, the Incarnation, I believe completely, it's in me. But I don't, but at one time, for several hundred years, it was the doctrine of the church that you could burn Jews and heretics at the stake to get them to convert. Yeah, I'm always so annoyed when people say that the teachings of the church never change, because that's not true. That's baloney. That's baloney. <laughs> the dogma, true. the infallible dogma of the church does not change. The doctrines, by definition, are not infallible and therefore open to change. Let me give you a contemporary example. For the entire history of the Catholic Church, until 1996, slavery was acceptable. It was not morally wrong to hold slaves. In the 17th century, some people raised the question, uh, some people raised the question in, in, in Europe and here about the immorality of slavery. And the church said, 
in the church. And by that, I mean the, the teachers of the church, not dogmatically, not infallibly. <coughs> the church said, the church said, if you did not believe, if you believe that slavery was intrinsically immoral, you were a heretic and subject to the Inquisition. But they didn't say it infallibly. It's just a bunch of cardinals or bishops in Rome talking out of their own personal consciousness. The fact that they didn't say it infallibly meant that it was possibly fallible. And in 1996, Pope John Paul II said, slavery everywhere and under all circumstances is intrinsically grave evil a mortal sin. There you go. The dark, the, the kingdom of God lives within me. The infallible dogma lives within me. But certainly, certainly not all the things that justify the Inquisition, the Crusades, and all kinds of going to war and killing. No, those are dogma and those are doctrine. And doctrine by definition is fallible. And therefore, I am not obliged to assent to the non-infallible if I see that the non-infallible is mistaken by my conscience and consciousness. For example, and I'll just give you one more example. When I was at Notre Dame as a student back in 1958 or so, uh, my moral theology book uh, called Christian Virtues uh, composed by a man, by the, a priest by the name of Charles Sheedy, PhD in theology, imprimatur on it, said specifically, Catholics could not be pacifist. That's what it said. I got the book here. I still got it. I've got an underline now. Catholics could not be pacifist. And I, I believed it. I do. I have no question about it. Hmm? And yet, and yet, Dorothy Day, Mother Teresa, you name them, what shall we say? They reject war completely. No, you must make the distinction between infallible dogma and calling doctrine dogma. Doctrine is not dogma, it's fallible. It, it may just even be, in most of these cases, not even doctrine. It may be just collective opinion of a, a moment in time. A tolerable opinion that the church tolerates doesn't look at it one way or another. But infallible dogma, yes, that lives in me, and the kingdom of God does. Okay, that's a good clarification. Um, yeah, I'm really like, you know, on the edge of my seat listening to you because I, I'm, it's like, I always feel like when I'm voting that I am being manipulated and like I'm being had, you know, like I'm, my consent is being manufactured in a way. <laughs> like I'm being forced to put my stamp of approval on things I don't approve of through the whole process. And, um, you are, you are, you're right. Your feeling is right, but I've just articulated for what's going on. And by the way, I, 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 unlike Billy Graham and a lot of other people, you know, I don't say what I say to have an altar call to see how many people will come up and agree with me or disagree with me. You just say it to make people unsubscribe from my YouTube channel, don't you, Charlie? No, 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 <laughs> no. They love you. They, they wouldn't miss you for anything. But I say it. I say it because it is my obligation as a disciple of Jesus who, is, who has the gift of the Holy Spirit as everyone else does and who's baptized into Christ and has as much responsibility for my position in the church as the Pope has for his position in the church as a Christian to, to clarify as I see it has to be clarified, the truth of reality and the truth of the gospel. Because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And what is not the truth is not of the holy. 
And what's not of the holy is not of Jesus. And what's not of the holy is not of God. And therefore, it is important not to argue with people, but to say, think about it. Examine your conscience on this. Pray over it. Are you really, are you really doing the right thing here by voting for these these people who have climbed their way up the power ladder, not the authority ladder, the power ladder by doing all kinds of things. You know, when, just to give you an example, when William Clinton was running for president um, and was losing, losing the election, this is with Democratic nomination, and he was losing the Democratic nomination, and he had to, and he had to prove himself some way, set himself apart, that he was someone that the, the real money people could put their bucks behind and he wouldn't disappoint him. And he didn't disappoint him with Glass Siegel and other things. But anyway, so what did he do? He's, 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 um, he's campaigning in New Hampshire and there's an execution taking place down in Arkansas, an execution warrant that he signed. Um, the man's name was, uh, gee, Billy uh, Ray, God, I can't remember it now. Anyway, he was an illiterate, uh, he, he, he was a, an illiterate, um, mentally deficient person, black person, who indeed had killed someone. And there were all kinds of questions regarding his conviction and all legal questions, and they were all settled. And anyway, the, 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 the date was decided when they were going to execute him. And Clinton went down for the executions, particularly went down for it, and then came back to New Hampshire, left the same day and came back to New Hampshire. He wanted to show, as anyone must show if they're going to be head of a big time government, he wanted to show that he was willing to use kill power and it didn't bother him. Kill power is what you've got to be willing to use to be president, prime minister, king, dictator, whatever. So he went down and he executed this man, right? He was there. Now this man, it's funny, I can't remember his name. I knew it well at one time, Billy Ray or something like that. Um, this man was, was so mentally retarded that on, that on his way to being executed, his lawyers mentioned this, on his way to being executed, just before he was executed, they, you know, it's, there's a certain point in which just the prison guards take you like a sack of tomatoes and do the things they have to. But anyway, before that, when his lawyer was there, he said to his lawyer, do you think God in heaven will let me take care of flowers? Oh, wow. What, what? And Clinton is there all riding up all the way to the presidency of the United States. Didn't make any difference to him. It's like when George Bush, that woman, I, you, you may remember this one, when he was governor of Texas and Texas had during his time more executions of, of, of uh, people than at any other state in the union during his reign there, power, there was a woman who I guess had killed her husband, but anyway, every no one wanted her to die because she had made such over the over the decades she had made such a such a tremendous such a tremendous uh, change in life in the prison life, and no one wanted to die and so forth. And finally, as it came time for her to be executed, they arranged someone arranged for her to specifically go and talk to. From prison and talk directly to George Bush. And she did, and she asked him for the pardon for the thing, and she was sorry. And he said no. And that. But after she left, after she left, the day she was executed, after she left, he is telling his friends, and people overheard this, and that's why it's known, and that's how it got out there. He was mimicking how she cried and whimpered and wanted life, and I just didn't give it to her. 
It's all in the record. It's all public. But making mocking her, mocking her. Yeah, that's pretty terrible. No, but that's normal. Yeah, that, that's normal. That's not that. That's not. That's what power people do. And just to be clear, you don't even rise anywhere near that level. Where you where where, where you will. Uh, have any hesitancy at killing people if the interest of the United States and the, the economic interest, political interest, whatever it is, of the United States is at stake, you'll kill. You don't even get close to that unless you've participated in approving of that for a long, long, and being part of it for a long time before you ever get on a ballot. And so, and so, what this is about here is just getting straight what governments, what states really are, what, what elections really do, what they're all about. That's factual. I, I, anyone wants to talk about that, that's fine. That's just factual stuff that, that is, that's total political uh, philosophy, sociology. That, that's not even an issue. The question is, how is a Christian how is a believer in Jesus, a disciple of Christ, one chosen by Christ to the agent of his Holy Spirit of love into the world, how does one relate to that? That's the only question we're dealing with today. And my decision made 40, well, 50 years ago now almost, is no, I'm not going to participate. You give me two alternative cesspools to drive, drop, to jump into and say, yeah, here, choose. You, you, you gotta choose one or the other. You gotta jump into this uh, this cesspool of evil or that cesspool of evil. Um, I'm not gonna jump in either. I'm not gonna walk away. No, I don't want either of those cesspools. I don't, you know, way back, this is 15 years ago, uh, when you lived at the Agape community, sometime around there, out in, out in where, Massachusetts? Yeah. Uh, sometime around way back then when um, uh, there was a movement in Massachusetts to reinstitute the death penalty. Massachusetts doesn't have the death penalty. I think it's the only state that does it now. But anyway, and the vote was going to be close. And, um, and so the people from that community, the Agape community, uh, and I was one of them and so forth, we went down and we, we, we picketed at the state house to say no to the death penalty, huh? Because it was about to, it was about to be closely passed in the Senate, Massachusetts Senate, and that would have brought the death penalty to Massachusetts and, okay. okay. So anyway, we were, we were, uh, the, we were picketing outside with signs and so forth, right outside the state house. And um, and what I did was I left the picket line and I walked into the state house. I did have my priest clothes on, you know. I walked in the state house and I um, I, I I I knew someone who was a state house guard and. Uh, I worked it out so that that I could buttonhole, get a hold of senators when they come out, when they came out of the chamber. They had to go to the bathroom or something like that, or were just leaving. And I didn't the, the case I made to them because something like ninety two percent of the Massachusetts Senate is Christian, one form or another. As they came out. I buttonholed them one at a time, personally, not rushed. And I made the case to them, you're a Christian. Jesus, Jesus suffered execution by the state. He didn't teach execution. He was a victim of state execution, not a propagandist for it, not an agent of it. You're a follower of Jesus. What do you want to be? But then I make the point, and here's the point I'm getting to here. Then I make the point. 
in this structure of things, if you vote for the return of capital punishment, then every time a human being is electrocuted in the state of Massachusetts and is burned to death in the electric chair, with all that pain and agony, you're part of that execution because you voted for it. And that's the way it is with voting for president. I, yeah, I, rem I remember, I remember the, the, uh, the joy when Clinton was elected. I, I said, to, and these are people with nonviolence. These are people with, with uh, whole histories of knowing what government is and how, it, and how you know, to, to how government lies and cheats. Uh, no, they knew. And they were just, they were so mad at the Republican Party. And uh, at any rate, I remember, I, I remember that um, they, they were overjoyed when Clinton was elected. And when the collateral damage from his election began to fall, the people he was killing, the, the, the Iraq, 400,000 children in Iraq, et cetera, et cetera, what did they do? They elected him a second time. I don't want to be part of that. That's, that's not what it means to be Christian. Yeah, I think, I think the hard part for people, and I'm speaking from myself included in that, is, is um, it's just that this is such an intrinsic part of what it means to be human, is to live in these societies with governments. And it's, um, it makes me, I don't think I would be so open to hearing this, Charlie, if you hadn't told me many years ago to read Rene Girard. Because once I started reading Rene Girard, you know, it started kind of making a little bit more sense. And I think people struggle with it, you know, Catholics who approve of the death penalty and who believe, you know, that it's our obligation to vote for whoever um, in a given election. I, I think it's like people struggle with almost thinking like, well, Jesus wasn't that couldn't have been that radical to question or oppose the very foundations of human civilization <laughs> is the way I is the way I kind of think of it. Um, that it's it's he wouldn't be that radical. He wouldn't expect us to um, not participate in something that's so fundamental to living in a human society. Um, I think it's just, it, it strikes people as so very radical, but it wasn't until I read Gerard that I started to understand, like I've been thinking more this year about, ever since I wrote that essay on Franz Jägerstadter, about when Jesus said, I have come to reveal things laying hidden since the beginning of the world, that something is hidden from us that we can't see, that we can't understand. And somehow the foundations of the world like covered it up. And he was there to, ex to reveal what was covered up somehow by human society. And um, it's, I think it's just hard for people to understand like how deeply corrupt and, and, and really almost satanic this power is that you're talking about, this power of violence, the power of culturally approved killing that everybody wants to get their hands on. Um, I don't know, those are just some things that are kind of occurring to me. But if, if anybody's listening, if you're not aware of Rene Girard, that's another thing, in addition to Tolstoy, who wrote a great, that great book that you told me about, Charlie, The Kingdom of God is Within You. But it wasn't until I started reading Girard that I really started thinking about this. It kind of broke me out of, I don't know, just the way of looking at human life and being like, well, every government kills people and has the right to kill people, and that's just the way it works. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's just, uh, they, they, they call it in sociology, uh, Ellen, they call it the nomus. The nomus is the taken for granted knowledge in any society. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's what you're nurtured in. You can't, see, you, you can't see around it. You can't see through it. It's very difficult to even see any, any ask questions about it. Uh, so for example, if you were born in a cannibal society and you started you know, and you started, for some reason, you saw someone killed and they were going to take him home to dinner and drink his blood and eat about, and you saw that and you'd say to yourself, well, 
gee, maybe that isn't right. Maybe that's not the way to do things. Um, and then you just, just take, I'll, I'll just give you a little, suppose you felt that inside all of a sudden, you know? And then suppose you went down to the local cannibal pub that night and you said, hey guys, you know, I've been thinking about this. You know? <laughs> I'm sorry, just the idea of a cannibal pub. You know, then you down to the cannibal pub and you say, <laughs> Hey, 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 guys, you know, I've been thinking about this. I saw, I, I saw old, this guy being killed the other day, and I've been thinking about it. You know, he's, he's like us. I watched his pain and everything the same way I were acting. Do you, do you think we ought to be doing this, you know? And they'd, they'd dismiss you. They'd give you back, like, yeah, get out of here. You know, don't bother us. This is crazy. Why? Because that's all they've ever known. They've lived in a two-by-four cannibal world all their lives. And that's voting. We just grow up with the assumption that this is the way human society works and we have to participate. The assumptions that we get from the cradle through family, through state, through school, through church, we just grow up with them and just take them that there's no way to, and there is no way to question them because suppose it were to continue that that's still gnawed at you. You saw another person kills the dinner and you said, gee, this is just, this, this is this is just wrong. It doesn't feel right to me at all. You know, something inside you said, some empathy cord or something said no, and you act and you went back to the boys at the pub and you raise it again. And what they do is they get together and they say, let's say your name was Ralph. They say, Ralph, look, we're hearing you. Uh, we understand. I, we know you're living under pressure one kind or another, but look. We're going to pick up the tab for you to go to the cannibal psychiatrist. They send you to a psychiatrist because you're not, you're, you're not thinking like the rest of the society thinks. Yeah. So you go to the psychiatrist and you explain to him, I just think these people being killed are like us. I mean, I've even thought they probably have children and, and families and, and that sort of thing. And I, I just don't think, I mean, we don't have to eat people, you know, we, we don't, we can do without this. Uh, I don't see why we're doing it. And then after you go to the psychiatrist for 50, for 50 sessions at $200 a session, the cannibal psychiatrist would say to you, Ralph, I know what your problem is now. I, we can fix it, but I know what it is for sure. Bad toilet training. Bad toilet training. That's how I analyze your problem. You're psychologically off. Well, you just say, you know, it's not bad toilet training, you know? You, you just feel it's all that. So the show, the boys at the pub see that it doesn't work. The psychiatrist doesn't work. So then they pull out the big guns, you know? And they send you to the cannibal priest. And the cannibal priest says to you, he says, Ralph, he says, don't you understand? The cannibals to this day are the, are the oldest existing form of community in the world. Yes, we eat people. But if we, against God, we weren't doing God's will, if we weren't doing God's will, would God have kept us in existence all this time? All this time? No, no, no. Ralph, you're in danger of being a heretic. Well, if Ralph, you know, if Ralph gets around to, to reading Tom Sawyer and uh, he reads uh, Mark Twain, Tom Sawyer, and he reads that terrible passage, terrible theological passage in Tom Sawyer where, where Tom is going down the river with Jim, the, the black slave, and, and, and they get off the boat at some point and then, and then, all of a sudden they hear people coming and, and, and um, anyway, Tom is, the, the people are coming looking for runaway slaves and they get Jim and, and so Tom has to, uh, Tom has to make a decision. He's been raised from childhood, raised from childhood. And boy, did Twain know what he was talking about. He's been raised from childhood that to assist in the escape of a black slave meant you went to hell. But riding down the Mississippi on his little raft there with Jim, he's become associated with them. He's like them. He's his friend. And so now he has to make the decision to go to hell 
ought to stick by his friend Jim. And he sticks by Jim and tells him he's not a slave, he's his. Well, if, if Ralphie comes and sees that and is willing to take that choice that, that uh, you know, that he'll, he'll accept being a heretic, but he just, you know, he just stays around. And he just keeps saying there's something wrong with cannibalism. Eventually, the society is going to have to do him in. Because even the presence of someone that's telling the truth, when the society is living something that's radically untruth, the presence is intolerable. Like Julian it's Assange right, right now. Like Julian that's Assange. Right. You've yeah. got to get rid of him. Now, you may kill him. You, you may suicide him to death. But you 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 may send them to mental institutions, you know. You you may use electromagnetic stuff to make them crazy, but you've got to delegitimize them, and that will be done because you've got to get him out of your consciousness, not him, but the truth that he's just planting the seed about. And so, and so I mean. What are we going to do? We, 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 can, um, we can say, you know, that, that, uh, that uh, well, maybe voting is like, uh, maybe, you know, there, there, are those, <laughs> there are those Christians that say, oh, what we can do is, you know, we, we can, um, uh, we, we can, uh, we can, um, we'll, uh, will Christianize the government by having, uh, by ha this is the Opus Dei crowd and the, and the whole idea of Christendom. We'll Christianize the government by infiltrating it with Christians, you know? Well, uh, you know, Scalia sent a good, good Catholic man, send about 200 people to their death uh, and, under, and, and, and thought it to be following Jesus. And um, be that as it may, the thing is, you can Christianize the government like you can Christianize a brothel. There, the government is, as it functions, is intrinsically violent as we know government. And to participate in it is to participate in something that is intrinsically violent from top to bottom, 24-7, 365. Right, but the church has no problem with violence as long as you're using it for the right reasons or toward the right ends. And there is not, there is not, there there is not a single sentence in the New Testament, even a gesture by Jesus, that says, "All right, uh, love your enemies." Sometimes uh, you can you can kill people sometimes. You can turn the other cheek sometimes. No, that it's very, very clear. The best of scholarship, all of scholarship today is very, very clear that any justification for violence in Christianity comes from outside the four corners of the gospels. It's not there. Charlie, and, what? and therefore, Ellen, yeah. what that means is it's not the word of God that's being presented. At that point, it's someone's interpretation of the word of God, where they say killing, loving your enemies, doesn't mean you don't love them if you kill them. You can pray for them as you kill them or after you kill them. Nonsense. Nonsense. That's not what Jesus was talking about. Yeah. Charlie, has anyone ever critiqued your position on this as the heresy of quietism? Oh, quietism! Yeah, quietism is the uh, is, is the heresy that, uh, uh, that 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 you simply that you simply trust that God will do everything. God will save everything. You don't have you don't have anything more to do, and you just pray. And so some people might feel like not voting is a form of quietism. You know, okay. like you just leave it in God's hands and right, 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 right. And there's a there's a lot of that that goes around, but. No, this is not that. I mean, I mean, I think uh, people that um, people that uh, I mean, Dorothy Day didn't vote her whole life, not once. 
up to the last two months before she died, she said she hadn't voted and she didn't vote, period. And she was really pressured to vote for McGovern and so forth and so on. And she refused. No, she knew what this was all about. Uh, her words were something like the, uh, uh, I, 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 I don't want to, there's uh, they're, 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 they're something about the system being absolutely rotten and you can't participate in it. But be that as it may, um, be that as it may, Dorothy Day, all kinds of other Catholics didn't vote, but boy, were they politically active. There is more than one way to be politically active, and that's part of the problem, Ellen. Oh, that's can I just, before you keep going, can I just read the definition of quietism for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking yeah, about? Yeah, go ahead. So there's the, it's the abandonment of the will as a form of religious mysticism, or calm acceptance of things as they are without attempts to resist or change them. It can also mean withdrawal, withdrawal from political affairs. So I think you're saying that Dor like Dorothy Day could not possibly be called a quietist because it's not like she just sat there and accepted. She didn't that, accept as it was. There are many ways to be political. There are many ways for a Christian to be political. That is to interact with other people in the community for the common good of community. Many, many ways of doing that. It is the unfortunate reality that since the church is a structured since Constantine on the model of the, of the violent state, and they are violent churches, intrinsically violent, but, and the way that they handle their, the institutional church, um, since they are structured on that, then what they have left the impression with people is that if you don't participate in government, you're not participating in politics, and that is wrong. Dorothy Day was in politics up to her ears, day in and day out. And to read a good book on that, if anyone would like to read it, an excellent book on that is John Yoda's Politics of Jesus. Masterful book, masterful. But there are many, let me give you an example here, Ellen, from something you know about. Now you spent, as I remember, you spent uh, a year or something to up with the Agape community in, in Ware, Massachusetts, didn't you? Yeah, about, about six, six to seven months, yeah. Six to seven months, yeah. Now, now that, was a, that was a different kind of experience. I, now, um, the, the Agape community, I'm just trying to uh, find something here. Uh, the, 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 the Agape community is a, is a nonviolent Christian community in, in Ware, Massachusetts. And, uh, and it's there, it's in, uh, it's in um, what is it, Howitch, Massachusetts. So it's kind of out, out in the, uh, out in the, uh, uh, it's in the rural, rural area. Rural uh, kind yeah. of area. Well, well, it's by a big reservoir. It's got a big, it's very kind of got that, uh, it's not urban at all. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that, that's, that's right. And it's, it's kind of a, it's, um, now they do a lot of good things, huh? Really, a lot of good things, huh? They do, and, uh, and so forth, and and that's uh, and that's really good and wonderful. Uh, and so, um, but it it presents itself as a nonviolent Christian community. Okay, now you were there for a few months. Now, uh, long before you were there, I was there. <laughs> well, you and, you helped to found it in a way. Yeah, I was a founder. Yeah, be that as it may. But what I'm talking about here is on the 10th anniversary of Agape, way, way back, that's, this is, I don't know how long it's been around now, 30 years or so, but on the 10th anniversary of Agape, uh, uh, they, 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 they had an event and, um, and um, Dan Berrigan, uh, Dan Berrigan came to the event, you see? And, um, and he, uh, he, he gave a talk called uh, The Politics of Vision, or Voting in Vision. I forget how he said it, huh? See, the Politics of Vision and Voting in Vision. Um, let me get, you can find this talk either in the Catholic work or you can get it from the Agape newspaper, The Servant Song. It's published in one or the other someplace. 
Now I'm going to quote you a little bit from this Dan Berrick, who also did not vote. Huh? And his brother did not vote. In fact, his brother said famously, if voting could change anything, then make it illegal. Yeah, that's a good one. At any rate, that was Phil. Now, at any rate, this is a, just a little excerpt from, from, Dan's, from Dan's talk on the 10th anniversary of Agape, which is a nonviolent Christian community. And he says, he says, let us sing of things we will never see. You know, that's the way the Christian is supposed to think. He or she is supposed to rejoice in the fact if they live the Christ-like life, if they struggle to love as Christ loved, things are going to happen because you're bringing God in the universe. Now, we're never going to see them happen because, because the process of conversion is different than coercion. But the process of conversion, the process of coercion only changes behavior. It doesn't change the mind and the hearts of people, which the process of coercion does. So the things that may come from what we do may not come to the earth for a week or a day or a thousand years from now or 2,000 years from now. And that's what he's talking about, that, that we just don't rejoice in what we see in front of us happening. Let us sing of the things we will never see. I thought of this when I was asked to spend the day here at Agape, that this had something to do with visionary politics as opposed to ordinary politics. Indeed, as opposed to the absolutely deadly anti-human politics of our time. Something also that had to do with casting a vote in one direction or another. This has something to do with a candidate. Oh, stop. This has nothing to do with a candidate and has everything to do with what life is all about. I took it in this way. Let us sing of things that we will never see. I took it this way and I went back to the Latin word for vote. Latin is a language that I am quite familiar with. The Latin word from which vote comes is vovero, vovero, to vow. There are, there are a constellation of words that come from vovero, vovero. There's devoted, devotion, votary. We have a whole vocabulary of, vocabulary, of, vocabulary of depth in the human. Then we have this whole other kind of nonsense where we cast a vote as though one were casting away one's conscience. As though from this frivolous momentary act, we could justify all our indifference to the inhuman. Mm, that's good. While the fate of children in the unknown, and those on death row, in the poor, and the people dying in the next war that's coming, whenever that is, but it will come, that is left to others because we voted. There is a difference between casting a vote and taking a vow or veil. Now the people in the agape community, and generally those in this room who gathered around the people here, they kind of gather, they, they kind of sense the difference, understand the difference. The human vow requires renunciation. Renunciation is a great tradition that speaks of giving up our own happiness so others can have happiness eternally. Of saying no to the enemies of life 
in order to give a resounding yes to life in God. There has been a terrifying fiction at work in this country explained in the aftermath, uh, exemplified in the aftermath of the Gulf War. This would be Gulf War I. That is, that damage can be done in enormous measure and it will never ricochet back on the country. All the deaths of all the children, all of the sanctions put upon the people of Iraq, all of the suffering of the aged imposed on people by the United States embargo, all this will just happen over there. Within months of uh, the end of the war, we had our children killing each other in the uprisings in Los Angeles. And we've been having war with Iraq ever since. It is an extraordinary lesson, I think, that we, that we can wreak havoc on other people without wrecking havoc on ourselves. So there, there are so many people in prison. So many of our friends are in prison now, at this very moment, my brother is in, in prison. There is a seemingly hopelessness, but there is hope. My brother is in prison, and as we meet, this election is taking place. And if one just looks, there is no hope in it. But there is hope. There is agape. And you people who are here, there is hope. It's in we ourselves. So that's what Dan wrote. Huh? And I thought I'd read it today because, you know, it's, it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good presentation, you know, of, um, it's a pretty good presentation of the problem. You know, back in, um, back in, uh, oh, let's see, uh, oh, let's see, 1972, you brought that up this year, this year, yeah. I guess that's why I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, back in 1972, the Jesuit priest who was dean of my law school when I went to Boston College Law School, Bob Dryden, Bob Dryan, um, all during, uh, Bob, Bob, Bob Dryan quit being the dean and, and he ran for Congress and he won in 1972. He won. And um, there's a book by another Jesuit named Robert Schott. And uh, it's, it's, it's about, it's about Dryden. But anyway, in that book, Schott quotes the first time after his election to Congress that Bob Dryden, who was a Jesuit, huh? And Dan Berrigan, who was a Jesuit, the first time they met after his election to Congress. And Schultz writes, Berrigan proceeded to immediately question Dryden about his run for U.S. congressional seat. Berrigan told Dryden that while he appreciated his option, his opposition to the Vietnam War, quote, by running for political office in the United States government, you are involving yourself in the power structure in a way that inevitably is going to compromise you. Now, Bob Dryan wrote many articles in the 1960s where he made the point as the dean of the law school, Jesuit and everything else, highly trained, highly intellectual, he made the point that, that the Congress people have to vote according to their own value system, according to their conscience. And the point of these, all these articles was 
that you can't say I'm against abortion personally because it's killing a human being, but I'm voting for it as a public policy. If it is, if it's killing a human being and intrinsically evil, you can't be voting for intrinsic, e intrinsic evil as a public policy. And he has several papers and so forth on that. Now, no, no sooner than he get into Congress than he changed his position. You can hold the position that I am against abortion personally, but I can vote for it as public policy. And that's the position he maintained. I don't know if he was even in there. I, I mean, it was almost instantaneous. Inevitably, says Berrigan to him, you are going to be compromised. And he was big time, big time. Now, this is what we're talking about. Now, I, once again, I just want to be clear. I don't, I don't, uh, I can't read other people's consciences and I don't know other people's consciousnesses and I don't know I don't know what they're doing and how they're thinking. And I'm certainly not in a position to judge anyone in terms of eternal life or anything like that. That's, that's, that's far, far beyond me. Or, or any of us, we're not supposed to judge. And I don't. Huh? I, I think, I don't know why, why Drynan changed his position, why he did what he did, um, et cetera. But what I know is that he never could been could never could have been elected out of that district, never could have been elected out of that district that was a big time pro-life district, that district in Newton, a big time pro-life district that that he never, never, never in a million years could have been could, could have been elected out of that if he had maintained his position that what you saw as intrinsically evil for yourself, you could vote for as public policy. It could never happen under no circumstances. And so, and so I guess the thing here is, Ellen, that I guess the thing here is that's what we're talking about. Not just Drynan, and I, what other people do, they do. But it's you and I. It's those of us who Jesus called to be Christian. He is our Lord. He is our God. He is our Savior. He teaches a way of nonviolent love of friends and enemies in the gospel. Hmm? If, um, if we, our choices in life, our choices in life are not unimportant. This is a moral universe, and in a moral universe, good and evil have their repercussions over periods of time that we can't imagine. And it's not that this is not addressed in the gospel itself. This is addressed in the gospel itself, and let me tell you where. In Luke and Matthew, there are the stories of the temptations of Jesus in, in, in the desert. And so we know the story. We know the story. Jesus comes out of the desert after, he goes into the desert after being baptized and by John. And he, heard, and he hears the words, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased which is the opening line of the hymn of the suffering servant. He goes into the desert to try to understand what that is all about. And then, he, and, and then he's taken by the devil during his time there to a very high mountain, very high mountain. And one of the three temptations is the temptation to political power. Devil says to him, Satan, Satan he's called, Satan says to him, I will give you all this, all, that is, I will give you all the kingdoms. He shows them all the kingdoms of the world. 
And he says, I will give you all this if you will but follow, fall down and worship me. And Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. Very simple. Power, the power of the kingdoms of the world is the power of evil, violence, hate, betrayal, propaganda, deception, everything that Friedrich says, I read to you. That's, what, that's how they work. And Jesus says, sorry, that's not the way the kingdom of God comes. That's not, that's not of God. Yeah, that's and, pretty clear right there. And he says, get behind me, Satan. That's pretty strong stuff. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, since the, since the time of Constantine, the church's leadership, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, Evangelical, when they have been confronted with the offer of the power of the kingdoms of the world, to use. They have not said, no deal, get behind me, Satan. Since the time of Constantine, the church's leadership has almost universally said, let's make a deal. Let's make a deal, not get behind my Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Although, the gospel truth is logically contradictory to everything that the kingdom, the power is about that they need to be. Let's make a deal. Let's make a deal. Jesus says, no deal. No deal. And that no deal goes right to the voting booth right to the smallest sort of thing. You, one can say governments are a necessary evil and all that sort of business there, but that doesn't mean you have to participate in it. You've got other ways of serving the human community than that. There's other forms of politics. And if you form, if you live a political life consistent with the teachings of Jesus, you will do everything that you can possibly do for the common good. There is a passage, Ellen. There is a passage in the Acts of the Apostles, you know. And and the people and the people of the city that the that the um, Christians are in, they complain to the political boss of the city, the, the, the procurator, whoever he is, they are complaining about the Christians because they don't like the Christians. And the Christians are telling them something that they don't want to hear. And so this is, these are the words. These people who have, these people have turned the world upside down all over the place and now they come here. They all act in opposition to the decrees of Caesar and claim instead they have another king, Jesus. Now, in 311, you could not be a member of the fighting Roman army and be a Christian. By 416, you could not be a member of the fighting Roman army unless you were a Christian. A Constantinian interpretation of the Gospels and Christianity was introduced into the church. And once that was introduced into the church, it's not that the world was turning, it's, it's not that the church and Christians were turning the world upside down, it's that Christianity was being turned upside down because it wanted the power of politics, violent, deceptive, coercive politics. And that replaced the, the, uh, the church's 
point safe, clear, point blank, love is Christ's love. So it's not uh, a fellow by the name of a theologian back in the last century by the name of Rudolf, uh, what was his name? Rudolf Hanak, I think. He, he, he said, only a few, only a few Christian intellectuals and a few Roman scholars understood the threat of Christianity to the Roman Empire. Rome understood that if Christianity was to prevail, that means the Christianity of nonviolent love of friends and enemies, love of enemies, etc. Rome would be vanquished. And because they saw it their job to take care of the survival of Rome, they tried to destroy what would destroy Rome. Christianity. But they didn't have to destroy Christianity. Oh, they did. But they didn't. They destroyed it not by martyrdom, not by empire-wide persecutions. They destroyed it by saying to Christianity, come on into the big tent, Christian leaders. Come with us and we'll give you the goodies that we've accumulated from violence, from enmity, from deception, the goodies of the state. And they walked, and the Christian leaders walked in and adopted those means and accumulated and accumulated uh, their own treasures of violence and all the goodies, all their own treasure of wealth. There's a story, Ellen, of St. Thomas Aquinas way back on the steps of the Vatican, the old Roman, the old uh, St. Peter's Basilica, on the steps of the Vatican with the Pope. And both of them are watching a caravan of uh, jewels and furs and, and, and just treasures come in from the, from the Middle East that were conquered by the, by the, uh, by the armies, Catholic Roman armies. Papal armies. And the quote, the Pope making a joke said, um, no longer do I have to say, remember, remembering the Pope is the successor of Peter and remembering what Peter said to the man who was on the side of the road after, after the resurrection, on the side of the road after uh, and he was going up to temple and the poor man, uh, invalid on the side of the road, wants him to come over and heal him. And Peter says, and, 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 he, and he, Peter says, riches and gold, I have none, but what I give you in the name of Jesus Christ arise. So the Pope quoting that kind of humorously says to St. Thomas Aquinas, no longer does the Pope have to say, riches and gold, I have none. And St. Thomas Aquinas says, and no longer can the Pope say, arise and walk. That's what we're dealing with. Yeah. Charlie, I was wondering if you could explain then why you wanted this song to be playing at the beginning of the podcast called Happiness is Here Again. Oh, happy um, days are here again. Oh, happy days are here again. Because I don't know if I'll have a chance to like edit that into the video, but that you did want that playing. And I was wondering, maybe maybe we could kind of wrap it up and, and this could be a story we could end on. Oh, that's 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 fine. You know, I mean, I hope you got this. I, I hope you got the sense of that Thomas Aquinas Pope story I just finished there, Ellen, did you? I think so, yeah. Okay. The church is the, the church is not involved, should not be involved on the follower of Christ with what the world calls the art of the possible, for which it makes compromises. The, the Christian, the church is involved with with the with the art of what is impossible what is possible for God by fidelity and the struggle for fidelity. 
and what goes out over time and space from being faithful to the will of God, which is love, as revealed by Jesus. But yeah, okay, so back to the, you know, I, I uh, you sent yeah, me that I, little, I, go ahead. You know, and in my, in my mind, I'm thinking we have to do the podcast on why be a Catholic pretty soon. Um, why be a Catholic? There's, where, where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? <laughs> Everyone's a Catholic. We don't need, why, why, you know, why can't we just follow Jesus and the gospel and um, why be a part of the Catholic Church? I mean, I, I don't know. I just don't feel like I get that sense from the, our church that, like, that's what's going on. Oh, yeah. you, you well, Yeah, that's another talk. Yeah, yeah. We got another. That's a separate topic, and we yeah, were talking for a thing. long time. So you asked me about why I suggested as the opening thing for this, for our little talk here for today. Yeah. On, on voting, on voting. Well, you sent me a little uh, thing over the email. It was a little placard that you kind of took a picture of someplace. And the placard said, it was outside of a church, and it said, uh, in red, white, and blue, it said, Jesus 2020. It was, it was one of those voting placards, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so it was outside the church. I, that's, that's, that's very, uh, that's, that's, that's artistically uh, innovative, I thought. Anyway, as I looked at it, and I thought about the fact that, that yeah, if someone would have run on the Sermon on the Mount, I'd be happy to vote for them. I'm not going to vote for someone that's going to kill people in my name. So, yeah, someone runs on the Sermon on the Mount and they're going to be president of the Sermon on the Mount, well, that's fine. I'll vote. But you know, Ellen, back there, going back now to 1972 again, back there in the 7072, uh, 72 was a pr presidential election, and and uh, McGovern ran against Nixon and lost. But the front runner in that election uh, in 1970, early part of 71, was a man by the name of Harold Hughes. Harold Hughes was a the governor of Iowa for for a couple of terms, and he was a senator for a couple of terms, U.S. senator. And he was. Uh, he, he, he was a, a very serious, uh, seemingly evangelical Christian. That's how I always saw him as that, huh? And very straightforward. And uh, because he had been an alcoholic, he'd been dry for 35 years and so forth, but he was infinitely, uh, in, intensely involved in drug and alcohol re rehabilitation with other people, even when he was a senator. And... Um, Anyway, he ran for president, and for a while there, it looked like he was the leading candidate. After the election, um, people like Senator Gary Hart, who was considered the candidate, said that Harold Hughes was probably the only one that could have beaten Nixon that the Democrats had. Well, Harold Hughes ran, and he was doing quite well. I mean, he was, he was energizing people. He was kind of a charismatic guy, you know? Although you're not, not in the normal sense we think of that, but he did energize people. Um, but anyway, one day he got the question from a reporter or something like that. He got the question, if the United States was attacked, would you unleash our nuclear arsenal against the enemy? And after great thought, he said, no, I couldn't do that. Within two weeks, he was out of the race. Democrats or Republicans, they don't want anyone as president who's not going to kill for them and kill big time for them. Oh, yeah. And you need to be willing to do the first strike. It has to be on the table. Oh, you got to do the once you once you leave any any room open, you won't get funds. You won't get they'll 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 be putting stuff on the thing against you. You wimp and everything. No, now the reason I say that is, is because you ask you you send me that plaque, Jesus twenty twenty, a voting plaque, oh Jesus twenty twenty, and uh, the, outside of a church and um, and so I suggested to you that when you when you put this interview up, however you put it up, that maybe you should start with that plaque up and the song 
from Franklin Roosevelt's first uh, presidential campaign, 1932, the song that was a theme song for his presidential campaign was Happy Days Are Here Again. John Kennedy used it too with, uh, had Frank Sinatra singing it. But, the, but anyway, back to Roosevelt. Because remember, Roosevelt, 1932, the depression was on pretty, pretty seriously and everything else. And uh, he promised two chickens in every pot or whatever it was, be that as it may. But that was the song and everyone, everyone gravitated to him and he won big time. They all voted for him. Well, the United States didn't get out of the depression at all until, um, until, the, until Roosevelt took the country into war. But that's another story. But anyway, that was his theme song, Happy Days Are Here Again. And everyone knows it, happy days are here again, etc. Okay. Now, everyone calls the Sermon on the Mount the gospel within the gospel. It's, it's the meat and potatoes of what Jesus said. It is what he said. This is it. This is it. And uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, we have the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are they who mourn, etc. Well, that word blessed that's being, that word that's being translated blessed in Greek primarily means, or at least equally means, happy. Happy those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Happy the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Happy are those, all right? So, so I suggested, I suggested having as the theme song to open up this particular uh, podcast, along with the picture up there, the song happy days are here again because if if you vote for jesus whether you vote for him in the voting booth which you can't unless you write him in and then it'll be discounted but vote for him with your life vow your life to him forget the voting booth use volvere the vow all your life to him happy days are here again because the jesus is resurrected and that means that his way his teaching by word and deed are the ways to eternal happiness with God. Beyond that, <clears throat> St. Thomas Aquinas, <coughs> bouncing off Aristotle, but Thomas Aquinas tells us that people always, always choose for their own happiness. And that a great, what sin is, is people misguided, choosing for happiness what is not going to make them happy. Choosing the illusion of happiness over the reality of happiness. And so, happy days are here again. When you choose, to, when you vow your life, when you vote for the, resurrection, the resurrected Jesus, his will, his way, his truth, the eternal life which he offers to all humanity. So happy days are here again with that. Not with the election of another guy that's going to, a girl and women or whatever, that's going to simply use the power of violence, deception, fraud, betrayal, corruption, to force people to do things they don't want to do and to make money for a limited number of people. Yeah, is that is that the reasonable explanation of what I told you? I don't remember. Yeah, it is, it <laughs> is. So maybe I can get out, figure out that music so people can hear it again. Oh, you can get it, it's, it's, it's on there, even back in its 1930s uh, form, you know? And as I said, I, I don't, I, I don't think it's, it's still on the copyright because it's out of the public. You know, 90 years later, I'm almost certain to be out of the public domain, you know? Yeah, that'd be, be great. Be that as it may, I don't, uh, you know, you may never get this up anyway, because between Facebook and Tweet and whatever those things are, they may censure you instantly, you know? 
Oh, it's happening more and more. It's happening all over the place. It's another form of violence, you know? How, how is it possible? How is it possible? How is it possible to have, to have a democracy? People voting for what they believe is true when you won't let them hear the truth, when you won't want to let, let, let them hear the options. That's it. The whole thing is absurd. But it's not about, it's not about people voting their truth. It's about, it's about, it's about, it's about what is as natural to politicians, government, and media as breathing. Lies, 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 lies wherever it's necessary to lie to pursue its interest. Lies, yeah. lies, lies are to politics, media, and government. And I'd say to corporations, they are as they are as normal as 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 wet is to water, you know. And lie, lying is right up there. We should we need to hold you a whole different podcast on propaganda, censorship, lying, but it's right up there with killing, right? In terms of Lying, uh, lying, the lies lying, and... lying, lying in the morality of the Catholic Church is intrinsically evil. Yes, yes, there is no situation in, 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 under which it's approved. Lying is intrinsically evil. Oh, and going back to one more point, circling back to the fact that you said you didn't think voting was intrinsically evil. Mm -hmm. And you probably would say that not voting is not intrinsically virtuous correct oh oh absolutely correct there are people who are not voting uh because they think it's rigged they think it's you can oh ellen the catholic church so much is tied to in, in, in real moral theology too so, so 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 much is tied to why you're doing why you're doing something huh right yeah and so, and so i'm I, i'm not voting because i first of all because what i'm being asked to vote for is someone who will do things that are absolutely positively radically contrary to the Jesus teachings of the gospel. And secondly, because Volvero, I'm choosing to do another kind of politics, which is the politics of the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. Person, person by person, talk by talk, meeting by meeting, whatever people are giving, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you for meeting with me today, Charlie. And well, that's pretty good, although I don't know what you're going to do with all this. I don't know. That, that looks like it's about three hours long. Yes, but it's, you know, you have 80 years of wisdom to share. So we can't pack that into 20 minutes. It's just not going to happen, you know? Maybe well, 20 years is... ago we could have. 50 no, years no, 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 no. This is uh, 80, 80 years of wisdom, 80 years of experience, 80 years of seeing how things work, 80 years of seeing people crushed absolutely crushed day in and day out by government at 80 years of seeing a few people living well off government very very few all over the world whether it's saudi arabia or england or wherever and those few people constantly rich and old rich men finding things that they want in the world and sending the children of poor people out to fight to kill to get them. Now, I've, I've watched a lot in 80 years and uh, I was around before the First World War, before the Second World War, and uh, I don't know if I've, if there's really been many years that the country hasn't been at war that I've been alive in those 80 years. Anyway, Ellen, it's not about this country. It's not about Trump or Biden. It's about it, it's 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 about what voting is. Period. Just secularly, and how the Christian is to engage with that, whether not to engage in it or whatever. Yeah, and God, you know, I don't remember where it comes from. Is it a psalm or something? My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Like, yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's Isaiah. That's Isaiah. So it's Isaiah. Yeah, I mean, it, the more I, the the more the years pass for me, I guess I'm, you know, it's it. The more that makes sense. Anything, anything that you or I or the Pope can think of, or or Trump or Biden, can stop evil. You can be absolutely sure it's wrong. 
because the mystery of evil, the mystery of iniquity is only one inch shot of, one inch shot of the mystery of God. And the human, the human mind cannot figure out how to stop it. Jesus, it can't figure out even where it comes from. Jesus does not teach us the history of evil, a philosophy of evil. He does not teach us where evil comes from. He teaches us only one thing. How, how, to, act, how to act to vanquish it. Yeah. And we either choose that or we can write books till we're blue in the face about why there's evil, why there isn't evil and so forth. No, just, just, you know, I, I think it was Dan Berrigan that said about Dorothy Day that uh, she was a Christian who actually believed what Jesus taught. It's that simple. Yeah, to believe it, to trust what he said is true, right. and to just do it. Do whatever he tells you. That's it. That's, that's just it. Just do it. Oh, that's yeah. So I, always, I think I, I, I think I, I think I better go. And at eighty years old, I, I, I probably, uh, I, I probably got to get my, um, my. Uh, uh, senior citizens Centrum Vitamins, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Your you silver, know? See, silver, right. silver, silver Centrums, they call them. I see them in the store there. Yeah. Silver Centrums. I need my silver, you know? Well, just, just be sure that it's, you know, remove your mask to take the vitamin and then put it right back on when you're done taking the vitamin. Hey, um, I'll, give you, I'll give you a thing that we could do. <laughs> you want a podcast that we could do? What? I'll, the podcast of the churches, the leadership of the church locking down the churches worldwide. I, oh, I'd like to get into that one because I just think that's, that's, that's an abom ah, that's terrible. That's, that's, that's so depressing. Yeah, we should do it. Bad stuff, you know? Yeah, we should do that. I, I don't know what, I mean, I think you said they got a billion dollars or something and COVID. Oh, yeah, the Catholic Church got a billion point four dollars for fighting COVID. What are they doing, you know? But they are certainly, <laughs> That what that means is, Ellen, that as is clear, as known as in all kinds of political and public relations circles and everything else, that if a government wants to get people to do things that they don't want to do, then what they got to do is they got to reach into their trust network. That yeah. is, they reach into the network of, of organizations that people trust pay them off, and then the organizations tell the people to do what the government wants them to do. Mm -hmm. It goes on in all wars and everything else, and it's going on in this, you know? It's, it's just, uh, this is, I can guarantee, I know, I know people who have all but lost their faith because of the way this, the way the church is handling this. It's it's been bad for me, I'll admit. I mean, I'm not losing my faith, but it's like, come on, guys. Like, they just go along with everything, whether it's a war or the COVID thing. There's nothing that's coming from the church that's that. And they also never talk about it. Like, my priests never address what's actually happening in our lives. They I'll just talk you. about every, every yeah, homily is like it. totally like um, divorced from anything. It's like, anything that's actually happening it's just so now, now this is this that this should not be part of our po podcast we ended our podcast on a good note but yeah yeah about the happy and the sign but you know that's that's just a fact of, that, that that's just the fact of life and huh? that 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 uh, uh priests are under under terrible constraints because of their promise of obedience to the bishop and the bishop's ability to to cut them off at the knees in terms of salary, in terms of faculties to say mass and so forth, even yeah. in terms of being a priest. And so, and the tendency is that diocese, you can't transfer as a bishop between diocese, as a priest from diocese to diocese. If they don't want you in one, no one else will accept you. That's kind of the unwritten agreement between bishops, you know? Yeah. So, so they got them. They got them. And if they say, and if they say, don't say a word about the possibility that we could do better in the church with, uh, with having people come every day, having the churches open, come if they wish, 
having masses double every day since the priest has no more to do, since the other things are closed down, have two masses a day, morning and evening, <clears throat> as you would in any, any normal crisis. No, no, just shut it down. And churches that were at one time, not too long ago, a few months ago, were packed on Sunday, now have 10 people. There's nobody there, yeah. No one there, no one there. And I'm people telling got you, used to watching it online, and then they just figured, oh well, if this is good enough, then they kept watching it online, and then they just stopped doing that too. That, no, it's going to have a, it's going to have terrible, terrible, terrible repercussions, Ellen. Yeah. In the, in the church, and and that's that's, but but, but yeah, we should do that podcast. Soon. Our task is just, you know. If we get out of the boat with Peter and we run towards Jesus in the middle of the storm, don't look at the waves, for heaven's sakes. Keep your eye on Jesus. Yeah. Because if you look at the waves, they're going to crush you. They're going to drive you into the ocean. No, nope, keep your eye on Jesus. And That's you'll walk good. on water. That's good advice. Thank you so much, Charlie.